Welcome to day two of ERIE 2020 online. First on the program today is the presidential address. And our chairperson for that is next year's chair of the scientific committee, Elisabetta Yossa from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. Elisabetta? To welcome, to welcome Professor Sir John Vickers, President of the European Association for Research in Industrial Economics since 2018. After a period working in the oil industry, John Vickers taught economics at Oxford and was Drummond Professor of Political Economy from 91 to 2008. He has been warden of All Souls College in Oxford there since. John Vickers was Chief Economist at the Bank of England, member of the Monetary Policy Committee, Director General of the Office of Fair Trading, President of the Royal Economic Society, and Chair of the Independent Commission on Banking. In 2005, he was knighted in recognition of his outstanding public service. John Vickers' scholarly research interests span theory and policy, especially relating to competition and regulation. His books on privatization and regulatory reform, his articles on vertical separation and access pricing, on the impact of competition on innovation and growth, on price discrimination and abuse of market power, have not just been read and cited by thousands of academics, but also have had a significant impact on regulatory policies around the world. Recently, John has been doing cutting edge research with Mark Armstrong on product market competition in the presence of imperfect consumers, a topic which he will talk us about today. Before leaving the screen to John, let me just add that John's tremendous academic and policy career reminds us all of the exceptional opportunity that we all have to make the world a better place, addressing the issues that really matter. I would also like to thank President John Vickers on behalf of us all for his contribution to the association. He has strengthened it and safely guided it in difficult times such as the present one. Just two words about the rules. Please send your questions to the Q&A chat box. I will read them at the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you, John. The screen is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Elizabeth, for those uh extremely generous remarks. Let me, um, let me now pull up my slides. I hope, that, um, <clears throat> I hope that has worked. The first thing I should do is to um, explain why I've chosen this title uh, for the talk, Competition for Imperfect Consumers. Now, much of the theory of IO, much of what we study at, as industrial economists is imperfect competition for consumers or other customers who are pretty perfect in the sense that we commonly assume that they have thorough knowledge of what's on offer in the marketplace and that they uh, choose the best deals for them given their preferences. However, in, in case after case, we see that there can be a lot of imperfection on the consumer side. And by that, I mean limited awareness on the part of consumers about what deals are available to them or, and or limited awareness about the consequences of entering into particular deals. And there's nothing irrational about being an imperfect consumer in that sense. We all, we all are. And given costs of information acquisition and so on, it's entirely a rational state of affairs. No one can be uh, rightly criticized in those terms. Sometimes we get very directly into competition issues, market power questions, when we have consumer imperfection of this kind. But quite often, the market as a whole can be fairly competitive, and yet we still have problems arising from consumer imperfection in the sense that I've described. And those are some of the issues that I want to talk about today. It's going to take us outside uh, the, our normal comfort zone of, of competition policy and regulatory policy into some areas that are perhaps less familiar to most industrial economists, into consumer policy, even into uh, questions in contract law. 
And when I was at the Office of Fair Trading, that was 2000 to 2005, I was very struck how economists were everywhere when competition policy came up, but were very hard to find when consumer policy came up. And I think that's an issue that we've gone some way to addressing, particularly as behavioral economics has come into, uh, been developed and come into the mainstream. But I want to suggest that there is further to go. Let me begin with one, um, one chart. So this is UK data, and I'm going to be talking about UK cases, the country I know best, at other points in the, in the talk. This is from the Competition and Markets Authority inquiry published in 2016 into retail energy prices. So here, um, running from 2004 up to 2016, is a scatter plot of a measure of price for what's called the dual fuel bill for a median consumer. So dual fuel means gas and electricity. And I'm aware that yesterday, uh, David Byrne was talking about um, uh, retail energy markets in Australia. I was in the other invited session, so I didn't have the benefit of seeing that, but it will link uh, very closely to what I believe he was talking about. So I want to make a few points about this. First is this market is not super concentrated, but, but um, neither, is it, uh, it's, neither is it super competitive. We've got six large energy firms in the UK. 30 years ago, they were monopolists in their regions, but since then it's been liberalized. And there's a bunch of mid-tier suppliers, new entrants as well. So moderately concentrated, but it's not highly concentrated. The second point is that you see the prices have gone up over time. That part, there, there are competition issues, there are wholesale price issues, there are environmental cost issues coming into all of that. But the really striking thing is the, I would say, astonishing amount of price dispersion. For essentially the same product, because it's a normalized product or service here, you see great price variation. And just eyeballing it, um, I think there's a tendency for the higher prices, not, not universal, but a broad tendency for the higher prices to be charged by the um, six larger firms rather than the independents, the, than the challengers. And the final point is that there's this black line, that's the so-called single variable tariff, which is the kind of basic default deal that consumers who don't shop around are put on. And you'll see that, again, not universally, but for the most part, that tends to be higher than other deals that are available in the marketplace. So I don't want to talk in detail about this case, but this fact of you know, huge amount of price dispersion does raise the question, how on earth can something like that happen? Why is it that for similar product, I mean, there are data issues and we might have to adjust for this or that, but how is it that some consumers apparently get much worse deals than others for essentially the same service. I remember in the early days of the internet, there were speculation that the law of one price might be enforced by the internet. That certainly hasn't happened, uh, as we can see in that example and many others. So we can get price dispersion in different ways. It can be different firms have different prices, but each firm has its own price. That would be one polar case. Another would be that individual firms have a whole range of prices, or maybe they fluctuate their prices over time. Or it could be the third sub bullet point there, which is that there are add on charges that if you're um, not a savvy consumer or if you're unlucky, you might be stung by high follow on charges. And I'm going to come on in a minute to a case of that kind. Whereas the, the more um, uh, streetwise savvy or fortunate consumers avoid those charges. Now, those those issues are linked, but I think we've got different strands there, which I'll talk about as we go along. So in policy terms, before jumping to policy interventions, I think one should always ask, well, maybe the market can solve these problems, um, assuming that indeed they are problems. Now, I think issues like this are problematic, but how problematic they are, as we'll see in other cases, I think is going to depend in part on how much welfare weight you put on the consumers getting the bad deals relative to the consumers getting the good deals. And in the energy example I just mentioned there, it tended to be the 
the low income households, often those in rented accommodation as well, who were on the single variable tariff getting the worse deal than the savvy consumer who could shop around. So if you put a higher welfare weight on the lower income groups, this is a bigger problem than if you don't. And then the other problem in, in policy is, well, if we are wanting to do something about this in policy terms, what can be done and how can be done it? And we need to be very careful about counterproductive consequences. And one of my themes is going to be the risks that there can be out there of counterproductive consequences in, in this sphere. So my agenda is this. I'm going to begin by talking or in a way just mentioning two cases about add-on pricing that are not in competition law, they're not in utility regulation, they're outside those spheres that a lot of us probably know best. Rather, they're an issue in consumer law, particular consumer regulation, and in much wider contract law. And I'm doing this partly to advertise um, what I think to be the importance and also the interest to economists of some of the matters that are dealt in those legal arenas. And one of my suggestions is going to be that we might want to do more as economists to get engaged with questions of that kind. Then I'm going to say something about some literature of 40 years ago, sort of foundation of eerie time, which is the launch pad for the modeling that I want to talk more about as the lecture progresses. But the main body of it, once I've done those first two items, I'm going to talk about um, a series of papers with Mark Armstrong. I want to, um, uh, it, this is all joint work with him, some of it with uh, Zhidong Zhu as well. Um, and I want to talk about some work we've done in the last decade or so, including some very current work. There are going to be three papers, in fact, three and a half, because one of them also relates to the uh, first of the add-on pricing cases I will get to. I'm absolutely not providing a balanced literature review. I'm just going to talk about these, um, this old literature, which I think is quite rich and interesting, and about these much more recent papers of ours, where many, many other people have done um, tremendously important work, which given the time, and with apologies, I will remain silent about. Okay, case one. <clears throat> so these are the first of two cases about add-on charges. The Office of Fair Trading, where I used to be, but this happened after my time, it brought action against the apparently rather high charges that consumers would face if they went into unauthorized overdraft territory. So if their bank balance went more negative than what they had agreed with the bank. And the typical per item charges, if that happened to you, were 20 to 25 pounds. This is in, uh, this is 15 years ago. And the OFT um, felt that this was unfair, something needed doing about it. So under some regulations called the unfair terms in consumer contracts regulations, and they are, they follow an, an EU directive. So across Europe and in some other jurisdictions, you get um, similar measures. They brought action saying that these charges could be assessed under that regulation and that they could take action against them, which they had done, OFT, with some success against similar charges in the credit card arena, late fees on credit cards. Other broad facts are these charges were a hugely important revenue stream for the banks. About 30% of their revenue connection, in connection with current accounts was from these charges. And in the population, it was roughly 80-20, 80% 80 of people never or rarely incurred these charges. 20% of households people did um, quite often. And it's 20 pounds a, a time. So there were consumers who were spending hundreds of pounds a year um, on this. And again, they tended to be the vulnerable consumers. Indeed, uh, a sharp question put by one of the judges was, is this a kind of reverse Robin Hood exercise distribution from the uh, on average poorer to the on average richer? The OFT won its case in, uh, in the High Court and in the Court of Appeal, but the banks appealed to the Supreme Court, where it was the banks that won and the OFT that lost. So this was a question of legal interpretation. Did these charges come within the uh, scope of the regulations? So it was about all about the legal background and it was a legal set of arguments. 
And obviously it was not a no-brainer. The fact that different courts had come, uh, came to different conclusions proves that even in law, never mind economics. But the Supreme Court took the view that these charges, even though they were contingent and were incurred by a minority only of consumers, they saw them as part of the price or remuneration, legal term, the package of services that a current account provides. Given that legal determination, these regulations could not be used by the OFT. So the OFT lost that case. And that wasn't the end of the matter because subsequent action by OFT was a reference to the Competition and Markets Authority and part of a much wider review of retail banking services. That led to regulatory uh, intervention. So not under the consumer contract regulations, but other regulations. So that now, among other things, we've got a system of um, auto text alerts if you're in danger of going overdrawn. And we have some new, in fact, just a few months ago, overdraft pricing rules by the uh, financial regulator, Financial Conduct Authority. So that this um, overdraft fees now have to be under a simple annual interest rate, not these extra 20 pounds, 30 pounds um, add-on charges. So this is, I mean, it's quite a big deal, this. I think the economics of this issue are quite interesting. And that's the legal and subsequent regulatory course that matters have taken. Now, Mark and I, motivated by this case, we had a, uh, advanced a very simple model. It's based, based on Gabe and Leibson model uh, that we published in Journal of Economic Literature 2012. And here um, is a stripped down version on it, which I'm putting up. It, it, it's a toy model rather than a model, but it's to make one or two um, further points. So imagine that banks are in perfect competition. That's not the situation in the UK, but let's assume that to bring out sharply how we can get a public policy issue uh, of a consumer kind, even when there's no imperfect competition problem. Maybe there is in other ways, but basically we've got perfect competition by assumption. Suppose that the service has a basic core element, think current accounts, price big P, and a tied contingent service, price little p. And let's suppose there's some high cap p bar that um, you, you can't go above the bank charging for that. Respective unit costs, upper and lower case c. Let's suppose consumers are of two types and banks can't see which is which. Fraction lambda are savvy, they avoid any risk of these contingent charges. Other consumers disregard them, either they're not aware or they're very optimistic that they're never gonna go overdrawn in this way. But if that bunch of consumers, any of those, if they're unlucky, probability tall, then they have to pay this, this other charge. So in equilibrium, you can have an equilibrium where the basic price is the, the, the equation in the center there, where the basic service is subsidized and it's subsidized by the expected profit from the non-savvy consumers. So the savvy types, they're actually getting their service at below cost. And indeed, in, in UK retail banking, you still have a system of free if in credit uh, banking. And this, you can see why the reverse Robin Hood exercise uh, point uh, could be made uh, in this context. Now, it, our market force is gonna get you out of this problem. Well, could well be not because the savvy consumers, nobody wants to attract them at this price because they're loss making. And the non-savvy, um, by assumption, aren't aware, don't pay attention to uh, the, the price that is, in this model, is gouging them. Another feature here is that while in many market contexts, the non-savvy gain from the presence of the savvy, we'll see some examples later, here is a context where it's the other way around. The fact, if you have more savvy consumers, that makes things worse, um, both for the savvy and the non-savvy, because the subsidy element that comes through that pricing equation in the center of the slide, um, uh, prices rise as the savvy proportion increases. And Mark, in um, paper in the Review of Industrial Organization, I think 2015, he calls that a, a rip-off externality, strong language, as distinct from the search externality in other contexts. So in these terms, in the toy model terms, OFT was trying to get P bar down through the unfair contract terms regulations. Supreme Court said as a matter of law, you can't do that. 
that subsequent measures have addressed both the PBAR issue because of the regulatory intervention and through the text alerts, the um, uh, probability that anyone will incur these charges. And there's empirical work, which the paper to accompany this lecture cites, which shows that these text alerts have had um, a appreciable measure of success already. Second case, I'm going to be very brief on this, but um, it, again, it's to advertise a bit of law that we don't normally think about. So a man called Mr. Beavis in 2013 parked his car in a car park linked to a shopping centre near Chelmsford railway station. As you drove in, there were big signs saying free parking for up to two hours. You stay longer, it's £85. He stayed about an hour over the two hour limit. So he got the bill for this £85. He said, I'm not going to pay it. <clears throat> it's not lawful. Not lawful because £85 is way more than my overstay of one hour could have caused the car park operator. It wouldn't have cost them an opportunity cost more than you know, sort of peanuts, very, very small. And he argued that there was a, uh, his lawyers argued, there was a principle of contract law, an ancient principle, which goes back in some forms, even to Roman law days, which you see in many, many jurisdictions, which says that the law will not enforce a breach of contract um, payment, which is a penalty. So he said, if it's more than a genuine pre-estimate of loss, which was a, um, a measure, a, a threshold, a benchmark for judging what is and isn't a penalty, with, with ancient pedigree going back to a case from 1914. So this and a linked commercial case came against the UK Supreme Court in 2015. And that court made a, um, uh, a restatement of this fundamental breach of contract payment clause, which affects economic transactions right across the economy. This is in, in, in England and Wales and in Scotland. And they said that this was not an unlawful charge. They said the true principle of whether something is a penalty or not is whether the clause imposes a, a detriment on the contract breaker, that's Mr. Beavis in our story, out of all proportion to any legitimate in, uh, interest of the other party, the car park operator. While compensation, making good loss, was a legitimate interest, not the only one. The car park operator had a, a clear interest in attracting short stayers who go shopping in the nearby shops and deterring long stayers, like people who keep their car all day in the car park while they commuted off to London. And the court said there was a legitimate interest in generating revenue from these charges for the, for the car park operation. Now, I'm certainly not going to get into the economics of this today. I think they're, they're really quite interesting. There are questions about incentives for efficient breach, investment incentives. And I think a very big deal here was the issue I just touched on about screening among consumer types. It's almost a two-sided market point, trying to attract the consume into the car park, people with a high propensity to shop, deterring people with a low propensity to shop. And my, my sort of intuitive view is that this is quite a reasonable place for the court to come out. But I, I mention it not because of any of those economics points, it's just that cases like this are a really big deal. And I think that certainly in the UK, I think in Europe, maybe a bit different in the US, I think most um, economists, IO economists, um, I think we don't naturally become aware of these cases or get involved in them uh, in any way. And given how important some of these decisions are, I think we might do well uh, to do so. Right, <clears throat> that's end of law. Um, the early economics that I mentioned, <clears throat> um, here is a handful of papers. There's this amazing symposium, Review of Economic Studies 1977. This is on the sort of the eve of what we think of or 1980s became known as the New Industrial Organization. Papers by Salop and Stiglitz, Salop, and I think a very important one by Butters on um, randomly informed consumers um, with adverts being sent out by firms and with probability distributions of, of prices. Then a very important paper by Halvarian, AER 1980, model of sales, 
of intra-firm price dispersion where firms using mixed strategies sometimes price high, perhaps often price high, sometimes price low, and he gave a model of why, um, why that would happen in equilibrium and interpreted that as a model of sales. <clears throat> and then an important paper in Econometrica 1983, Burdett and Judd, and the um, noisy search component of that paper, um, which is, is in itself a development of the Varian paper and has links to the Butters paper, that is going to be a thread through to some of the more re uh, recent work that uh, I want to talk about. So I put this up not to discuss it in detail, but in a sense to uh, pay homage to it. And then I'm now going to do a fast forward uh, to look um, in overview terms at some of the work that uh, Mark and I have uh, more recently been doing. And that work has had, I would say, two very broad aims. One is to apply models of that circa 1980 type, Varian, Badet and Judd, models of imperfect consumers in the limited awareness sense, and to apply that to um, questions that have been thrown up um, in some of the policy discussions and in cases like uh, some of those which I've already um, touched on. Because the, the engine of those, of those models was you have some consumers, the way the variant model works is you've got some consumers who are aware of all the offers in the marketplace, some who are aware of just one offer, and that mixed strategy pricing equilibrium uh, emerges very naturally in that context. The second aim, though, has been to get beyond the usually symmetric models which have addressed these issues in the past to try and look at asymmetric settings because there's very good reason to think and there's empirical studies underlining this that asymmetry um, in terms of consumer awareness and I'll say in a little bit more later what I mean by asymmetry is in many ways of the um, essence of the problem. So what I, what I plan to do now is talk about three um, models and do about 10 minutes on each. And the first one is on um, consumer protection and search incentives. This is a paper Mark, myself, and Jidong Zhu. Um, it appeared in GIA 2009 and uh, a, a linked paper from the mid 90s, I should mention, is by Fershman and Fishman. But Elizabeth, if you, if you, if you wanted to come in at this point, th this would be a moment. Otherwise, I'll keep going. Okay, uh, I'll keep going. Now, a very natural policy instrument to think about in these environments where some consumers seem to be getting a really quite bad deal and retail energy in the UK was the example I mentioned earlier, and this policy instrument has indeed been used since, is to have price caps. So you'll say we're not going to regulate prices thoroughly but we will, we will put a ceiling. Competition can happen below the ceiling, but we're going to put a cap on prices so that the relatively less aware consumers do have that public policy protection, but competition can still flourish uh, in terms of other consumers. So it's a very natural remedy uh, to, uh, to think about. However, there are risks of doing this, and they're summarized here. One often mentioned is that a price cap could be anti-competitive in that it might deter entrance into the market or induce exits because the uh, <coughs> amount of profit there is less. So that, that could be uh, uh, go the wrong way for you. A cap could arguably facilitate tacit collusion as firms float up towards the cap. And there's empirical work on, for example, credit card markets in the US uh, some years ago, which uh, found pretty strong evidence of that kind of thing happening. And it could also affect advertising and search. So the Butters paper, um, informative advertising is very important. You could imagine how a price cap might uh, reduce incentives for advertising and thereby end up worsening consumer awareness, which is the root of the problem that it's trying to solve. And finally, and the thing I want to talk about is um, deterrence of consumer search. So the, the worry here is that if you have a price cap, there's an obvious and direct reason for doing it, but maybe that will deter consumers from searching around for the best deal. The incentive to shop around could be blunted by that. 
And if fewer consumers are shopping around, then that might worsen the very problem that you're trying to solve. You may, you may have done better by the vulnerable consumers, but for consumers more generally, you might have uh, sent things in the wrong direction. So the very consumer lack of engagement problem that you see as the root of the heterogeneous pricing, the dispersion, you might actually make that worse, not better, by a cap, question mark. Well, that was the question we, we, um, uh, we looked at. So super simple model, this is just a sketch. Imagine each consumer has unit demand up to a reservation price. And to start with, suppose there's no, no price cap. Suppose that for every consumer, you can pay a, a, a search cost S, and that can improve your awareness of the deals on offer. So if you don't pay S, you get some random awareness of a few deals. But if you do pay S, you get random awareness of more deals. So you, you put yourself in a better information position. And we wanted to set this up fairly generally. So in the notation, an informed consumer, that's a superscript I, sees K price offers, offers with probability phi I K and always sees at least two. A less informed consumer has a worse probability distribution over how many offers they see. And sometimes they just see one offer. That's like in the variant model of sales. Normalized cost to zero, keep it simple. And you have at the bottom of that slide, the um, fraction of consumers that see just one um, offer. So one minus lambda is the proportion that do not search, fraction lambda do uh, become informed. And phi ui is the proportion of the um, uninformed that see just one offer. So when you work out the mixed strategy equilibrium, Irrespective of what's going on the, on the supply side, there could be loads of firms on the supply side. Again, its problem doesn't lie there, it lies with consumer imperfection. That is expected profit per consumer. Now, on average, the informed are going to pay a lower price than the uninformed. Indeed, that's the incentive to search. So let PI and PU be the expected prices paid by the informed and the uninformed. And the more you have searching, the higher is lambda, the lower those prices are. More people searching bears down on those prices, all of which is great. But in equilibrium, we're going to have this, this condition here that um, in equilibrium, if there's a positive amount of search, it'll happen up to the point where the search cost is equal to the difference between the price you expect to pay if informed versus uninformed. And you'll see, this is a very, very simple version of the model, that all consumers expected outlay is going to be this PU, because you either, you're either uninformed, that's what you expect to pay, or you're informed, but you pay the search costs. So either way, it's the same expectation for both. And then just using the first equality, you get the second one here. And what this highlights is that it'd be great if public policy could lower the search cost, but if that's taken as given, what comes out of this immediately is that the effect of policy is going to be how it affects this ratio of the prices paid by the informed and the uninformed. So even though the levels of both go down, if you've got more informed, which way does it go in terms of that ratio? And that is something about which I, haven't, I had no prior intuition. I think it's completely non-obvious. Now, what happens in the model, and I mean, I'm not going to go through the maths, what you can show, and it surprisingly general, at least surprised me and I think us, is that that ratio decreases the more um, informed consumers you have. So the price on average paid by the informed goes down proportionately more than that paid by the uninformed as the savvy proportion lambda increases. The other thing in this model is that the price cap itself, it affects PI and PU equiproportionately, so the ratio doesn't change. Now the upshot of all of this, and again, a bit surprised how, uh, how general this came out of the model, is that if you have a price cap, that will reduce the amount of searching going on, that will 
um, increase this ratio, PI over PU, and the price cap itself directly is going to have no effect on the ratio. And that's going to put, push up PU. So here is a model, which I think is not pathological. I mean, one can vary it, but it's a fairly natural model to write down, where a price cap is bad for consumers um, on average. In this particular model, it's not bad for total welfare because we've got unit elastic demands and so on. But for consumers, and that's our focus, my focus today, um, you get the sort of perverse counterintuitive um, effect going on. Is this a super general result? No, absolutely not. If search costs vary across consumers enough, then you can overturn the result and you get the more, uh, what I would have thought ex ante to be the more intuitive result. But it is, I think, um, a, a cautionary tale in a pretty simple model about how unintended consequences can, can follow. And just a picture of this, this is just saying the same thing diagrammatically. The solid lines are, here's the average price paid by the uninformed as a function of the proportion becoming informed, lambda. Here's the price difference curve. So, in equilibrium, that will be equated, if there is search, to the search cost S, and therefore we get lambda H searching. If you have um, a price cap, which diagrammatically pushes things down to the dotted line and pushes down the search um, incentive down, we go, we have a, you know, we like the reduction in PU that's direct, but we get an indirect increase, decrease in the number searching and we end up with a higher PU than under laissez-faire, at least in this version of the model. That's model one. Now I'm going to look at um, a separate issue. A again, Elizabeth, if you do want to come in, now would be a moment, but um, otherwise we could save things up. To, okay, to the, John, to the actually one. I will, because there is a, a question on the, on the effect of price cap by Paul Hedges. He says, uh, regarding the price cap in the search model deterring search, how important is that firms can charge only a single price? So why not offer a legacy price to non-searchers and then negotiate and set a different one for those consumers that search? It seems uh, to him that we learned yesterday that is what firms in Australia do and it should break the indifference logic. Using to construct, used to construct the mixed strategy pricing distribution. Uh, okay, so the short and, and honest answer is um, I don't know. And again, I, I'm well. I was happy to be in this invited session I was in yesterday afternoon, but I'm sorry in this context that I missed the um, uh, the discussion of pricing in Australia. And I, I look forward to reading uh, David's uh, work on that. Um, what Paul suggests could could indeed make uh, could indeed make a difference. We we were not setting forward a dynamic model. We were we were having um, one price per firm. I might mention that in some current work, which I'm not going to talk about, Mark and I are working on um, multi-brand firms where a, a given firm can charge different prices for different brands, even of an intrinsically identical product. And that, that looks pretty interesting, actually. And the, it links to the final of the three models that I'll talk about. Okay. Thanks. Okay, the next issue um, is this one about discrimination against captive customers. Now, this is a context where different prices are charged by one and the same firm. So in a sense, this may be a little bit responsive to Paul's uh, question. So here, um, this is by um, reference to a paper that Mark and I had in AER Insights recently, 2019. So it appears that forms of discrimination against captive or quote loyal um, uh, customers by one means or another, does appear to be quite common in a number of uh, markets. 
In fact, the first of the sub bullet points there does seem pretty close to my understanding of what Paul's question uh, was about and maybe relate to the, uh, the Australian case that we were talking about. Another example of this might be a chain store, say a nationwide store that face, faces local rivals in some towns, but not others. And it, if it doesn't have a nationwide pricing strategy, it might charge um, keener prices where it's facing local rivals than where it's not. Or indeed, there might be non-price aspects of competition, even if its price list um, nationally is, uh, is a given. And the third of the sub bullet points there refers to, again, I'm coming back to the UK Competition and Markets Authority, an investigation into so-called loyalty pricing. This is where if you stay on the same home insurance contract or mobile phone deal, uh, you often end up doing much worse than if you had shopped around. It's quite, it's a similar logic. It, economically, it seemed very similar to these retail energy uh, examples. And the CMA found you know, appreciable price discrimination based on, captivity is a strong word, loyalty. So this, given all that, a, a, a natural tool to think about is to ban price discrimination or to constrain price discrimination. But the literature gives us a warning on this, that in oligopoly, banning price discrimination can soften competition between firms in a way that is, detriment, is detrimental to consumers. Indeed, could even be detrimental to uh, all consumers in some circumstances. And I mentioned that pair of papers there from the late 80s, which make that point. So what Mark and I <coughs> do is to take a model of, the, of this Varian et al lineage uh, to look at the question of price discrimination against captive customers. And in the, the basic and most stark version of the model, we look at a duopoly where um, some consumers are contested between the two firms. Some consumers are captive to me. They have no uh, awareness of that you, the other firm exists. Other consumers are captive to you. They don't know that I exist. They've got limited um, awareness. Representative consumers set up um, as described on that slide, all fairly standard, normalizing cost to zero again for simplicity. And in the notation, uh, fraction sigma i of consumers are aware of, they consider the offer of firm i. So the remaining fraction, one minus sigma i, those are the captives, the firm j, um, alpha j. We'll label firm so that firm one is the larger one. And then a, a thing that matters in all these models a lot is um, what we call the captive to reach ratio. This is rho i, which is firm i's captives divided by total reach. So in this model, suppose, again, it's an extreme assumption, but it makes the point sharply. Compare the situation where firms can discriminate on the basis of captivity with the basis, with the context where they cannot, where it's either banned or perhaps they don't know who their captives are and who are not. <clears throat> so how can we, what's the comparison? Well, perfect price discrimination is really simple because the contested consumers will get price equal to cost, which we've normalized to zero. The captives will all pay the monopoly price. So you get extreme price dispersion. It's either monopoly or it's perfect competition. And in this world, each firm will get um, its number of captives multiplied by the monopoly profit per captive. Uniform pricing can be different. Then each firm, if they don't know who the captives are or if they're not allowed to discriminate, then there'll be some mixed strategy equilibrium in a model of, of this kind. And firms will choose price in some interval going up to the monopoly price, but from some base price denoted P0. And P0 is going to satisfy this condition where the profit ratio is going to be equal to the captive to reach ratio of the larger firm. Now, an immediate thing about this context, and this is true well beyond duopoly, it's true in all cases, is that firms make more profit in expectation with uniform pricing than with price discrimination. Because with price discrimination, they just get their captive monopoly amount 
with uniform pricing, they get at least that and the smaller firms do better. In a sense, they shelter under the price umbrella of the larger firm. The larger firm is never going to price very low because they've got all these captives they could be gouging. So the smaller firm can shelter, in a sense, under that uh, umbrella. So industry profit is lower with discrimination. So you might think, well, maybe that means discrimination is better for consumers. But in fact, there's an effect going the other way because the distribution of profit is much more disturbed, uh, dispersed when you have discrimination than when you have uniform pricing. So a good way, we would say, the key to clear thinking about this is to stop thinking in terms of prices and outputs. Think, go directly to the welfare terms, profit and consumer surplus. So this is a, 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 an approach we, we talked about in a paper almost 20 years ago. So think about consumer surplus as a function of profit. V consumer surplus of pi, how much profit I yield. And fairly generally, though not universally, V in those terms is a concave function of profit. And for that to be true, if the, that's true if demand elasticity increases with price, and this is price net of cost. So that's pretty commonly uh, the case. So what, the way we can now think about it is we know firms can't gain from that form of discrimination. If it's rather symmetric between the firms, we could take the case of absolute symmetry between the firms, the firms are going to get the same expected profit in both regimes. But profit variation across consumers is much bigger in the discrimination regime. And if utility as a function of profit is concave, Consumers don't like that. It's like risk aversion. So you have a, it's risk aversion with respect to profit variation. So the, the sort of aha of the paper is, if it's symmetric between firms and you've got this concavity condition, then consumers as a whole do worse with discrimination. But if it's asymmetric enough and under side conditions, Consumers do better overall from discrimination. They don't like the variation of profits. That's like a risk issue. But if things are asymmetric enough, the firms make so much more profit when they're discriminating that the flip of that is negative for consumers. So I hope that might respond a little bit to what Paul was getting at. What I've described is super simple and um, our paper does more than I've just said there. In particular, it leads on to the question of more general information structures, not just can you discriminate on the basis of captivity, whether consumers are captive or not, but what other signals might you have about uh, consumer, um, the position of consumers. And that links to work which Mark is doing uh, with Zhidong uh, under Mark's ERC award and it links to work of uh, Bergman, Brooks and Morris on information structures and how markets work. So I think there's a, there's a pretty deep micro theory issues um, that are linked by a thread to the, the kind of analysis that I've been talking about just now. Final segment, and then I will, um, I'll, I'll wrap up. Patterns of competitive interaction. This is joint work with Mark um, underway right now. Some of you may have seen one of us, probably Mark, give a seminar on this um, in the last year or so. Uh, but to you, I would say that one of the great benefits of lockdown has been that Mark and I in the last two or three months have, uh, we feel, got a much better understanding of the problem which this question uh, uh, is looking at. So I'm going to give a high level overview, not going to go into formalities, but some of them will be on the slides. <clears throat> so what's this all about? Let's now assume it's one price per firm. Uh, so it's not the price discrimination issue I was talking about uh, just a moment ago. Let's go back to the simple setting of unit demand up to reservation price. And again, um, zero cost. One can generalize that um, 
pretty easily, except for welfare results, which um, bring in other, consider other factors. So we've got a bunch of firms and we've got a, a mass of consumers. Each consumer is aware of the offers of some of the firms. A very well-informed consumer would know about the offers of all the firms. Consumers captive to me would only know about my offer. They wouldn't know about yours or any other firms. And in general, we can think of the fraction alpha S of consumers who are aware of precisely firms in set S, subset of the total set of firms. So this is rather abstract, rather general at the moment. We make some assumptions um, essentially that rule out Bertrand competition and pure monopoly because that would be boring. We want to look at the in-between case. And that leaves us with, again, equilibria involving mixed strategies. Maybe that some firms use pure strategies, but uh, uh, at least some, maybe all will use mixed strategies. And the question that we want to ask is, how does the pattern of consumer awareness relate to ideally the equilibrium pattern of prices? Are all firms going to be competing head to head across a common price range? Or are we going to get some high prices and some low prices? There was shades of that in the retail energy market context. So what pricing patterns are going to emerge? What's entry going to do? What's exit going to do? What about mergers? So that's the question. So it's how the patterns of consumer consideration, and here's a, a Venn diagram for a three firm case. How does the pattern here relate to, as I say, we hope the equilibrium or at least an equilibrium pattern of pricing. So in this picture, alpha one, two, three, these are the people here who see all three offers. These people up here, the alpha one types, they just see firm one's offer. And you can, you can imagine, we've got seven um, um, elements there. Um, we can imagine all sorts of weird and wonderful patterns or different densities of consumers in, in those different situations. So how do, how do those patterns, indeed for the end firm case, what can we say about how that relates to patterns of pricing? The way we talk about entry and merger, well, I've got the Venn diagram up. Entry, you can imagine a new, a new circle, a new firm uh, coming into, the, um, uh, into that diagram. That's not going to affect what, um, the, which consumers consider which pre-existing incumbents some consumers will become aware of the new entrant, others won't be aware that the new entrant has turned up. It won't affect the reach of any of the incumbents, it might eat into their captive bases. Entry has a weekly negative externality in this context, that's with the unit demand point coming into play, but if costless it is um, positive for total welfare. An exit is just the reverse of, of that. Merger, that's where you have two firms um, that the, uh, the union of their uh, sets comes about. So if firms one and two were to merge, then their total number of captives, it would be this and these previous duopoly people and the captives of firm two. So a merger we can think of in those ways. So we want to try and understand at least the basics of how, how uh, events like that would affect things. Now the, the key to the problem, we or what we think of now as the key, is if you look at it the right way, the problem becomes much more tractable. So we want to define these sigma S's. Sigma S is the fraction of consumers who are aware of the offers of all the firms in set S and maybe other firms offers as well. So this isn't just the alpha S people, it's um, all the subsets containing the firms in S. So the total reach of a firm, that's sigma i. And you can think for a pair of firms or a triple or whatever, or for the, the consumers who see the offers of all the firms, that's uh, the sigma of the total set of firms. Then the, the crucial step 
is to define these gammas. So this is a measure of multivariable correlation. Gamma S has, on the, in the numerator, the proportion of consumers who consider all firms in S, and in the denominator, the product of the reaches of all those firms. For the singleton sets, gamma is equal to one. For the case of independent reach, where the, the aficionados among you will know is common in the literature, papers by Ireland and, and McAfee in the 90s, for example, and, and shades of it in Butters as well. There, all the gammas are equal to one. But we might want to think, well, some, some firms might have positively correlated reaches, then we're strictly greater than one. Some firms, there might be consumers that never see both offers, that may, they might be disjoint, and then their respective gamma um, would be zero. And we know from empirical studies that the gammas or the equivalents of the gammas um, are certainly not always equal to one. <clears throat> now this case of what we call symmetric interactions is where the gammas for a set S depend only on how many firms are in S. Doesn't depend on the identity of the firms. So this is a bit like if, if for somebody who sees firm I the conditional probability that they also see firm J is the same for all other firms J. This still allows firms to be very different from each other in size. It's about the interaction between them that is symmetric. And this is, in fact, way more general than all the cases we're aware of in the earlier liter literature. It clearly covers symmetric firms, covers independent reach, covers asymmetric duopoly, and a whole lot more. And even if you have these symmetric interactions, you've still got lots of degrees of freedom. So um, the, the firm's size in terms of reaches can differ greatly. What happens in this setting is summarized here. With symmetric interactions and with the duopoly elements always being um, positive, there's a range of prices that all firms use from a base price P naught, which is the captive to reach ratio of the biggest firm, up to some maximum price for each firm. But the smaller firms don't price as high as the larger firms. So the maximum price of firm one, the smallest, is weakly lower than firm two, et cetera, et cetera, up to firm one. And if the firms are distinct in size, the very highest prices near the monopoly price are only ever used by the largest firms. So stochastically, smaller firms price lower than larger ones, but there's a range of prices where all the firms are head-to-head -head competitors. Profits are proportional to reach. So this sweeps up a lot of that earlier literature. And when we come to do exit and merger, the things that happen are essentially what, I think what you'd expect. Exit, raises the base price and the profits of the remaining firms, bad for consumers. Entry have to hold that because entry into a symmetric situation could create an asymmetric situation where the story might be quite different. But exit, very natural comparative statics. Merger, likewise, a profitable merger between a pair of firms raises the base price, bad for consumers. So far, so good. What happens though with asymmetry because there are many patterns of consumer awareness which don't fit the symmetric interaction world i just described indeed if you think about ordered search on the internet it could well be that everybody looks at the top results quite a lot of people look at the top two fewer at the top three and so on so we might want to look at asymmetric cases which our paper uh, talks about the starkest and in a way most asymmetric is nested reach. So here's a three firm example. <clears throat> the consumers in the, in the bullseye area, they consider all um, um, what all firms are offering. Firms in the outer ring um, though, uh, those are captives to firm uh, one in this example. So nested reach is a, the most radical departure from the symmetric case and very different things can happen here. So the takeaway here is that when you move away from symmetric interactions, even though that's pretty general, totally different things can happen. So I won't go through the formalities here, but let me give an overview 
of equilibrium with nested reach. So here each firm has a price support, but it could very well be that not all firms price in the low region. In fact, if firm K is twice as big as the second biggest firm, then firm K does not price in that low region. And the price supports of firms go up as you go through the probability distribution. And if the differences, the case of increasing differences indicated by this chain of inequalities, if that is the case, then we have totally segmented competition. If I'm somewhere in the middle, I compete with the firm that's just smaller than me in a price range and in another price range with the firm that's just bigger than me. But I never compete head to head in the same price band with the ones that are even smaller or even bigger. So we get a so-called overlapping duopoly structure of prices. So the head-to-head -head competition is only between neighbours. This is a completely different pattern of pricing that emerges. Another big difference, and here I'm just giving one sort of appetizer example, has to do with comparative statics. Imagine entry now with a starting with a symmetric duopoly where the entrant lands right in the already contested area. So it's not unrealistic that the consumers that are aware, of, become aware of the entrant are ones who were aware of competing alternatives already to begin with. And here there's a very simple argument as to why such entry is bad for consumers. It does nothing to dent the profits of the incumbents. The entrant makes some profit, it can shelter under this price umbrella of the incumbents. Welfare hasn't gone up, therefore the entrance gain is consumer's loss. It can easily happen in this context. Now this isn't the first model to have entry that's um, detrimental for consumers, but it can happen very naturally where you have asymmetric patterns of consumer awareness. It doesn't mean that entry promotion is a bad thing. If the entrant eats into the captive areas, or if the entrant reaches consumers that weren't being reached at all to begin with, then entry is great. But if it's this extremely asymmetric form, it's bad for consumers. And it's bad in a sense because it causes the incumbents to retreat to their captive areas towards them rather than competing with each other. That's the end of what I wanted to say on the three models. And I just want to wrap up with um, a couple of observations. I do think this area of consumer imperfection is uh, interesting and important. I think there's some great models from 40 years ago, which we can use and adapt and generalize to look at these questions. The policy questions are partly within the realm of traditional competition law and policy. It was a sense in which there's monopoly power over the captives and so on. But I think very often we're taken off into other areas. Um, the CMA inquiries in the UK have led more to regulatory remedies rather than antitrust remedies. And we're very often into consumer law and indeed even contract law as in these add-on prices, uh, add-on pricing cases. Do beware counterproductive effects. That's not an argument against policy intervention, but it is an argument about policy design. And to repeat what I said in connection with the, the law cases, I really do think consumer law and contract law is an area that Certainly IO economists um, uh, in, I'd say in Europe, maybe it's true more generally, uh, could do very well to get engaged with. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, John, for this uh, extremely interesting and uh, insightful, uh, insightful uh, talk. Uh, we have uh, uh, some questions, so a question from Massimo Mota. I have a number of questions, but I will, uh, I will, uh, uh, I um, first uh, uh, mentioned the one by Massimo. Uh, so I read it aloud. John, we're used to think as consumer protection policy as distinct from competition policy. Do you think your models could say something about the possible link? For instance, can you think of consumers being aware of all offers in a similar way as consumers who are better able to compare offers? So that a policy which increases transparency is similar to one which makes more consumers informed. 
generally the intuition could be that more transparency leads to more competition. Clearly, just to add, uh, it would be great if you could also tell us more about your view even in the in the babies in the overcharge cases, no, the the, the court in a way uh, took the uh, 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 decided to enhance transparency as a as a policy tool, not by making by making sure that consumers were aware of the overcharges and by uh, even uh, uh, deciding that the overcharges were to be advertised as a percentage of the interest rate. So it would be great linking myself to what Massimo was saying. If you tell us more about uh, the rule of transparency in, 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 in this talk. Okay, well, broadly, um, I'd say that more transparency is good for market performance. Um, it's partly about information. I mean, there are a lot of subtle issues about, you know, too much information could lead to less understanding, not more understanding. It's not only informational, though. I think some of this could be um, behavioral economics type biases. You know, I might know that they're high, these overdraft charges. I just think I'm never going to go overdrawn. And I might be wrong about that. I might misperceive the probabilities. I say broadly positive because I, there are some settings where, because of the endogenous interactions, uh, of firm behavior and consumer behavior, you could get effects rebounding um, the other way. And remember in some of these add-on pricing cases that having, uh, increasing the number of well-informed consumers could have a negative externality on the less well-informed. That's not true in the search models I talked about. It goes the, the other way. It's good for the the unaware benefit from more people being aware. But there are some settings where the opposite happens. And that, that distinction between the positive or negative externality of greater consumer awareness was in a sense the key point that Mark and I were, were trying to draw attention to in, in our paper. So the informational externalities can be quite subtle. Now, whether this is competition policy or consumer policy, or something in between. It, it, it partly depends on how we use those terms. I think very often this is not abuse of dominance, it's not anti-competitive agreements. Uh, some jurisdictions have, like the UK, can have market investigations that lead to remedies or, or to advice to regulators like energy, finance, or, or even legislators to do things. But there are these tools of consumer law, like the unfair contract terms, regulations, which um, we don't seem to spend a lot of time thinking or talking about as economists, at least in the circles I'm familiar with. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so there is another question. Uh, yes, Xavier Vives reminds us that, of course, more transparency may enhance uh, collusion. Uh, in, in a sense, you have answered to this uh, by saying that there are trade-offs so we should take into account. Uh, so this is another, another point. I agree. Uh, let, me, let me though follow up on these comments anyway, collusion competition policy. Um, so you mentioned that uh, in the current papers, you given also the complexity of the new uh, framework um, that uh, um, you, you, the subsets in, in which consumers are divided are given. Okay, so uh, the the way patterns of consumer awareness affect competition, you emphasize the, the patterns of consumer awareness affect competition, but this, uh, the set of consumers are, are given. However, you mentioned that, of course, this could be affected by firms policy like advertising. So isn't there a lot to worry about, especially in the digital industry where a lot of this consumer information is uh, um, uh, in the hands of platform providers and platform providers making money through advertising have a lot of incentives to maximize industry profits. So isn't there a lot to worry about how platform providers and firms in particular can use information sharing or 
other things so as to ensure that the pattern of consumers awareness is competition i would say in theory yes i mean that that is a um a theoretical concern to have whether it's an empirical concern i i don't know in one way i'd like to take a step back and um when i talked about aim one and aim two of this line of work in a sense aim three would be to understand this patterns of interaction model well enough that one could then look at questions about search advertising and endogenous information structures by firms or in your, your example platforms and so our first aim I, you know i did talk about entry exit and merger but mostly we're taking the pattern of awareness as exogenous and trying to deduce what happens with the pattern of prices and when we went this was sort of real research in that we had no idea what the answer was going to be and i think these segmented pricing patterns um, we, we find pretty interesting so understanding the, the what are the key kinds of asymmetry that drive effects this way and that i think that's the way to open up the next step which would be search advertising maybe multiple prices per firm and so on so i was giving a report on, on where we were in that journey okay um we have a uh, maybe uh, uh, one minute left so maybe we have a uh, um space for really literally one more question I'll, I'll, uh, I know that in the audience there are lots of people listening and they might be interested a lot in working on these models. Uh, you presented us some versions where uh, we, we had two firms only, okay, and then uh, there is a clearly the generalization. Do you think we can uh, work with the two firms only or we're missing, going to miss out a lot? Well, I mean, the, the patterns work I talked about at the end, they're clearly more than two firms. The price discrimination thing, what I presented was the two yes, firms. Yes, and, and the paper, um, much of the paper is about the two firm case just because it's, it's the cleanest to work with. But I think there are certainly gen generalizations that one could make. And indeed some, some aspects of the AER Insights paper do look more generally at that. Um, so I think the, the thing is to understand that the, sim the simpler and then, then push it forward. And in the patterns work, I think we've, we feel this summer we've made, we've got a bit further. So we're optimistic. <laughs> That's great. Okay, thank you, John. We, we are uh, run, uh, running out of time. So a big uh, clap of applause from everybody. I'm sure uh, we all enjoyed the talk. Uh, it's been a really uh, broad, um, giving us a broad perspective and uh, an invitation really to think more carefully of consumer protection and also, you know, in reading between lines, distributional issues, if I may say, on vulnerable consumers. Okay, so we, we, uh, uh, we're going to conclude this session 